the path to a billion users, a billion plus users, three billion users, is that like that type of thing? What's going to get get Cardano there, or, or are there many different arms in that story? Yeah, there's tons of arms, and it's not a unilateral path where you know I'm going to figure it all out. I have a particular itch to scratch, which is the development world. And that's what I'm going to go do, along with some other things. And every now and then we stumble upon a Fortune 500 like Dish that wants to come in and work with us, and we say, "Great, it's very exciting." Uh, but then there are other people like the foundation, they're, they're going to try to onboard 50 banks, you know, and there are other people who are onboarding their local community and doing community-based projects or building companies like Sunday Swap, for example, on the ecosystem. And then if the technology is great, it's better, faster, and cheaper than most of the people in the space, if not all of them. So people are just cost conscious will come in. Uh, and there are other people where they have assurance requirements that only Cardano can satisfy. So they'll come in. So it takes a village, and this is not one company sitting down figuring this out. Your path to a billion is a, a multi-model and a multi-agency model, just like Bitcoin, where everybody feels some form of accountability. In the early days of Bitcoin, BitPay sponsored the St. Petersburg Bull, it came the Bitcoin Bull. You know, in the early days of Bitcoin, uh, Roger Ver was going around convincing barbers and coffee shops to accept Bitcoin. And he wouldn't leave until they took the, the Bitcoin. I mean, there was, there was all, so many different people from all wakes of ways. Andreas Antadopoulos, going on Joe Rogan's podcast, doing Mastering Bitcoin. You know, Eric Voorhees doing Shapeshift, these types of things. So everybody has a place and a role. And great ecosystems give people the freedom and luxury to have a place and a role and to feel comfortable like they're welcomed and included. And bad ecosystems, they start taking that away from you and telling you what you have to do and you feel like only one person can solve all the problems. That's, that's, uh, that's not right. So we have some strategies, I think, that can get a lot of great user acquisitions. Beautiful light client experience, you know, getting it in the browser and making sure that you have a beautiful DAP store combined with a great voting center and, you know, really nice identity. Furthermore, Catalyst is going to be extended to give you voting and governance tools for the DAPs and native assets that are issued on Cardano as much as Cardano enjoys. So in DeFi, there's a huge surge, especially when regulation comes for it, to decentralize. And you need governance for that. So that means all these DeFi protocols have to basically figure out how to write voting protocols and become governance experts and all these other things. Well, what if you get that for free, incumbent in the platform itself? That's a huge competitive advantage when people are migrating. Because at the end of the day, they're not loyal to the underlying infrastructure. They don't wake up and say, boy, how do I make Joe Lubin and Vitalik rich today? Nobody says that. You know, they're just using it because it has network effect and it's a means to an end, but it comes with a lot of trade-offs and at some point you have to migrate. And so either they go layer one and build their own chain or they go to a different chain. And so, you know, the question is, are the USPs appealing enough? And over time, they become that way. And it's a marathon, not a sprint. Just because you have great network effect today, I, one of my favorite ways of explaining the value of network effect and technology is saying, if you really believe that's a big deal, I tell you what, pull out your BlackBerry phone Okay, go to Yahoo and search for your MySpace page. Uh, go ahead and find it and log in with your AOL account uh, and then post on MySpace uh, your feelings about all of it uh, on your Windows computer. <laughs> yeah. Man, I mean, that's getting that's, me all nostalgic over here. Yeah, I know. That's network <laughs> effect, right? And yeah. at one point, all of those were the market leader. Okay, they had all the power and, and now they're all gone. So network effect is ephemeral in technology, and it's connected directly to evolution of technology, consumer preferences, and the evolution of business models, and the fact that people age out. The next generation comes in with no preference. All these people in Africa have zero preference to these types of things. Uh, Cardano, in some cases, their first cryptocurrency. So that's only valuable for a moment, and it gives you the ability to stay alive for that moment. It gives you the luxury of being able to make bets but if you're too slow, you could lose out in the whole thing. There's a famous memo that Microsoft Research wrote in the 90s that basically Bill Gates commissioned. He said, tell me about the next 10 years. And in the memo, they predicted the rise of Google, Facebook, and the iPhone. So Microsoft had the means, the position, and the knowledge of where the future was, yet they missed all three. Yeah. So they were the Goliath, $600 billion company, the largest tech company in the world at the time. And they had a monopoly, yet they, they weren't able to navigate. So network effect is only so good and only so powerful. And, you know, oh, Google's so powerful. What if they win, they lose the metaverse and everybody's on the spatial web? 
they're going to be contextually searching in a geolocational space. So they don't have to use the Google search engine to search. So it might be the case that 100% of desktop searches, cell phone searches, and other things are still done with Google. But what ends up happening is that people grow around them. That's what happened to Microsoft. They never lost the desktop war. They had near 95% installation on desktops and laptops was Apple having the rest. But then everybody just started getting iPhones and, and Android phones and tablets and things. And it turned out the preferred computing device wasn't a laptop and uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a desktop. It was a cell phone and a tablet. And so now there are four times as many of those devices as there are Windows computers. So they never lost a customer, but they lost the war in that respect. So it's all about that type of growth curve. And you have to think about the next five years and 10 years, where will people be using these things? For example, if you're an NFT guy, you have to be a credible metaverse player because that's what's going to preserve NFTs. It's analogous to domain names in the web browser. You know, so the web is infinite, but you need some scarcity there. So how about Microsoft.com, Google.com, these types of things? That's real estate in the web. And if you own it, it could be worth millions of dollars. Well, similarly, NFTs connected to a metaverse, that creates scarcity in an unlimited spatial world. And then suddenly you will have the equivalent of a Microsoft.com or that type of real estate in the metaverse. So if you're serious about NFTs, that's an area where you have to dominate it and do something good in. Has anybody yeah. succeeded in that yet? No. And new players are entering all the time and there's no network effect there. And there's fundamentally different technology to be a good player there. And there's a great book called The Spatial Web that talks about that. Another is called The Infinite Retina that talks about it. That's just one example. If you talk about regulation, you need to win the identity war and the metadata war because you, compliance is coming. How many people have a path to, to contingent staking to comply with the 2023 mandate in the infrastructure bill? We do. Our competitors don't. These things. So you have to think where the puck is going, where the future is going if you want to exist in that world. And network effects rapidly and radically change based upon this emerging and changing landscape. A VR AR is going to be fucking huge. Apple's entering this market. They have 5,000 engineers working on a headset called the QO. KUO, 5,000, probably 2023, 2024 is coming out. The minute that happens, Samsung's there, Microsoft's there. Everybody's going to be in that market. It's going to be in eyeglasses within the next seven years. So the AR revolution is coming there. Everything's going to change with that. So where does your blockchain fit in this type of a thing? You see, who are the biggest adopters that will give you billions of customers? You ask, well, how do I get a billion? What if I got Microsoft on board? One client, three and a half billion customers. Hmm. You know, what if it got built into Windows? You'd have it just right there. How do you get there? Well, what do they care about? Do they care about growth? No, they already own the whole market. They care about safety, compliance. They care about software quality, these types of things. We win there. Our competitors don't because they focused on a JavaScript as .com move fast and break things model. And when regulation comes, who gets hit the hardest? The people who have no strategy and plan to accommodate for it. The ones who do, they win. So the game is not even close to over and, you know, there's, there's, there's tons of things to do. And it's, it's just all about what vision and philosophy you have five years, 10 years, 15 years out. And do you have a community that helped you get there? And do you have the patience and appreciation to know when to strike and when to hold back and how to build as much as you have to when to grow and acquire?